Turn, please, to Matthew chapter 5. Please turn to Matthew chapter 5 in the gospel of Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 17 through 20, which will be our text this morning. When first century Jews referred to the law, they could have meant four different things. The Ten Commandments, the first five books of the Bible, the Law and the Prophets, that's a reference to the entire uh, Bible, or scribal, oral law. Jesus, in this passage, is attacking the oral law of the scribes and the Pharisees. It was the scribal law, the oral law, which, Paul, which the apostle Paul utterly condemned in many areas of scripture, uh, in, in, in the book of Romans, in the book of Galatians and other places. Christ here is trying to turn people back to the word of God, not the oral tradition of men that they put in place, that man put in place, and that from time to time we put in the place of the word of God. Jesus exposes the difference between truth and man's tradition. Prior to the sermon, the scribes and Pharisees were already accusing Jesus. They were saying, you're trying to abolish the law. You're trying to take precedence over the law. The fact is, is that Jesus was pointing people to God's revealed word in the scriptures, not man's application of the word in the oral tradition. That's what our Savior was trying to do. And I would remind you that he is the word. John chapter 1, 1 through 4, we might reference this again. In the beginning was the word and the word was uh, God and the word was with God. And, and he created all things. Go back there and look at the passage. I just botched it. <laughs> but go back and look at it. I think you got the point. Okay. The fact is, Jesus is pointing people to God's revealed word, and that's what we need to see in this passage. The scribes accused Jesus of unfaithfulness to the scripture, if you can imagine that. Christ was not unfaithful to God's word. He rejected man's traditions because that was not the word of God. Let's read it again. Think not that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily, I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass away from the law. Look at it, ladies and gentlemen. Till all things be accomplished. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments, these least commandments, and shall teach men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is a powerful passage. I don't know if you've ever read it and felt the power, but I hope you do this morning. And the reason why is because it elevates your love for God's word in all things, in its entirety. It challenges you to interpret the scriptures correctly, to study seriously. That's what Jesus is asking us to do here. And it scares you. Out of adding to or altering anything that is in the word of God. So with those thoughts on our mind this morning, there are four major points. Four major points that come out of these four verses that I want you to remember. And first is this. The all-sufficiency of God's word. He said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus states, I didn't come to abolish. I didn't come to destroy scripture. Jesus is teaching in this sermon and elsewhere in the New Testament, his teaching in this sermon was not meant 
to abolish. It was not meant to alter. It was not meant to destroy or to tear down or to replace the Old Testament. Absolutely not. Do you know what abolish has to do with? You look that word up, and what that has to do with is, is tearing a house down. To destroy, to obliterate. Christ was neither giving a new law nor modifying the old law. He was explaining the true significance of Moses' law. I want you to see it. The true significance of the theme of the Old Testament. Christ is telling his listeners that he is the fulfillment of the law. He is the fulfillment of the prophets. And not just in some aspects, but in all aspects. He fulfilled the moral law by keeping it perfectly. He was perfect. He kept the law perfectly. He fulfilled the ceremonial law by being the embodiment of the law's types and of the law's symbols. He fulfilled the judicial portion of the law by personifying God's perfect justi justice. Now, this is just the truth of the matter. The enemy, Satan, wants to get you off the Bible track. That's what he wants to do this morning, and that's going to be his goal your entire life and my entire life. He's going to try to get you off the path. He's going to try to get you to veer off of the straight and narrow road. That's what his goal is. And one of his successful weapons is to get you to think that God's word is not sufficient in some kind of way, shape, or form. That it ain't going to get it. It's lacking in some way. And so I ask you the question, is the Bible sufficient for the church's evangelistic tasks? Is it? Many churches and Christians today, they don't seem to think so. Now, why is it that I say that? Because they abandon Bible teaching for ear-tickling entertainment. That's what I see. That's what I hear. Trying to do sacred work in secular or worldly ways only produces what? Worldly results, secular results, materialistic results. And I'll tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, those results will be shallow. Those results will be unstable. Is the Bible sufficient for the church's evangelistic task? Yes. Is the Bible sufficient for growing spiritually in Christ? So many churches don't believe that it is. Churches offer self-help programs, uh, entertaining or critical blogs. I see that more and more and more today. Uh, you focus on the latest theological controversy uh, instead of living dependently upon the word of God. That, that's what it is that, that I see, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and, and I'm here to tell you something. The Bible is sufficient. The Bible can take care of whatever need it is that you have. The Bible will help you grow spiritually like nothing else can. Is the Bible sufficient for making an impact on society? I don't think there's a whole lot of churches anymore that, that believe that. I think they doubt that. Well, how do we know that it's sufficient to make an impact upon society? Well, in instead of teaching the Word of God, instead of enveloping ourselves in the Word of God, people put their effort into political action agendas or groups Churches are lobbying for laws around the Supreme Court or some other uh, political situation for electing Christians uh, in office, a moral legislature, or political leaders. There are churches around our country, and that, that's what their focus is. Now, look, from an individual standpoint, 
you personally and your ideologies, your personal desire to make this country better, those efforts might have some value, I suppose. But that is not God's way of transforming society. God doesn't transform society that way, ladies and gentlemen. That's not his way. And by the way, God Almighty controls this world. He built it. He created it. He created you and me. He created all the politicians up in Washington. Every last one of them. The United States of America and every other country. He created that. It's his. Don't you think he can control it the way he wants to? It's not the work of the body of Christ. That's not what our job is, political action groups, lobbying for changes in the Supreme Court. That's not what we're about. Christians need to stand on the sure foundation of God's word. Amen? We must understand that God will bless it and he will transform lives through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is his way. That is his way. Is the Bible sufficient for making an impact on society? Oh, yes. Let's talk about the inspiration of God's word. We find that in verse 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a jot, not a dot, not a tittle will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Christ is emphasizing the inspiration of Scripture. And he is specifically affirming the inerrancy. Now, do you know what the word inerrancy means? Perfection. The perfection of Scripture. The perfection of the Old Testament as the Word of God. How perfect, you ask, down to each vowel to the smallest Hebrew and Greek letter. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now let me reemphasize. The New Testament should not be seen as replacing the Old Testament, but fulfilling it. It fulfills it. Jesus Christ fulfills it. The Old Testament points to the new covenant. It is a tutor that brings us to Christ. Did you know that all the ceremonial requirements of Mosaic law were fulfilled in Jesus Christ? Therefore, there are no longer observed. They are no longer required of Christians. We are not under the Old Testament because it has been completed. Not one tiny word is thereby erased or replaced or neglected in any way. The underlying truths of these Old Testament scriptures, they remain and are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The mysteries behind them are revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 18 is clear. They've not passed away. They've not failed. They've not dropped off from the word. To set aside scripture, any of it, was never the agenda of Jesus. Jesus shocks this crowd. In verse 18, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law. Not the smallest letter or stroke. Not one jot, not one tittle. Literally, it says, not one iota or one horn. The iota was the smallest Greek vowel, sometimes even located beneath uh, another letter. And you can see it, the tittle uh, there, just the smallest little mark. It's like a hook or a tail uh, that distinguishes one letter from another. Can you believe that? Not one jot, not one tittle. And you, and you can understand this by, by our letters, O. And Q, okay, or C and G. Just one 
little mark. Just one little accent. So a jot refers to the smallest Hebrew letter. The yod, which is the meager stroke of a pen, like an accent mark or, or like an apostrophe. I'm trying to get you to see this the best I can. Every dot and stroke of the pen is an ins it's inspired, ladies and gentlemen. It is the perfect word of God. Not one thing is out of place. Let me tell you something, folks. I hold in my hand perfection. Is there anything in this world that's perfect? A newborn baby, yes, you can hold perfection in your hand, spiritually speaking. This is perfect. There isn't anything else like it. It holds a distinction that stands apart from anything else that we have or we can look at or we can touch or we can embrace. And the enemy, Satan, desires with all of his heart to turn your focus from the truth to tradition, to human ideology, to what you think is good or what satisfies you. And here is a warning that you should consider. Be sure you don't spend more time with authors and with bloggers and with sermons and with all of that stuff than you do with the study and the reading of the written word of God. That's what happened to the nation of Israel. Did you know that? That's exactly what happened to the nation of Israel. They slowly drifted away from the truth. And you and I, and I cannot emphasize this enough, brethren at Bel Air, I cannot emphasize this enough. You and I face the same danger. Far too many of us are caught up in friendships and family and work and all of that over our Savior and all of that over his truth. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with family and, and, and all, of, all of that. And you know that, friendships and all, that means a lot to me. But let me tell you something, this means more. It's God's inspired word. It's God's perfection for us. Every single word is God-breathed. Can't you imagine that? The creator of the universe has breathed perfection for us. Indeed, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. And the reason why they won't perish is because the perfect sacrifice gave himself spilt his blood for you and for me. And in that is love, ladies and gentlemen. God breathed. Can you imagine? I can remember when I was a little boy putting my face up against my great-grandfather and I could feel and smell his breath as he spoke to me. God Almighty is speaking to you. Look at how Jesus begins verse 18. For truly I say to you. Now, do you know what truly is in the... In, in the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, in the Bible, what that word truly means. Do you know what it means? It means amen. Did you know that? It means amen. Truly, I say to you, I'm telling you the truth, people. That's what Jesus is saying. Our Lord is looking you in the eye. Have you ever had anybody eyeball you? My mother would eyeball me. The Lord's looking at you with love in his eyes. And he's saying, look, listen to me. I'm telling you the truth. He's saying, this is what I consider important. This is my word. Verse 18, until heaven and earth pass away. The phrase, do you know that, that phrase, 
That one right there, and I think this is right. Maybe, I, I may be wrong, but I don't think I am. Until heaven and earth pass away, that phrase is used 31 times in Matthew's gospel. 31 times. That is to say, as long as this present world exists, none of God's laws will pass away. Not tradition, but God's truth. Not sermons, but scripture. Not blogs, but Bible. John chapter 10, verse 35, the writer there says, the scripture cannot be broken. It cannot be broken. Listen, folks have tried to get rid of this since it was written. And you know what? They can't do it. It just keeps making more copies and more copies and more copies and more copies. And the reason why is because it's God's word. It's God breathed. You're not going to destroy this. Jesus is affirming the trustworthiness and the reliability of scripture, of all of the scriptures. He is moving people from tradition to truth. Sure, listen to sermons. I'm all for that. Listen to blogs. I don't even know how to get there. But whatever it is, go over there and listen to some of it. I think that's great. And read books, but not more than, your, than the Bible. Not more than Scripture. Listen, if you want to go, if, if you seriously want to go and listen to what I've got to say twice, okay. <laughs> go back here. Take a note or two and read what the Scripture says. Okay? Do that. The Bible alone is the inspired word of God. It is perfect. Look at what John chapter 5 says. Jesus says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bore witness about me. That's the Old Testament. It bears witness. That's what Jesus says right here. It bears witness about me. And yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. The perfect word of God loses preeminence in our lives. You know it does. It absolutely does, ladies and gentlemen. It, it has in my life. It, it, when our personal beliefs and our tradition, and we get too high and mighty with the way we think about things and the way we think things ought to be, uh, they take precedence. And it conflicts with Scripture. Let me tell you something. In our church here in Bel Air, Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. In our church here in Bel Air, are you listening? The Bible wins every time. And if it doesn't, I don't belong here. And if it doesn't, I won't be here. The Bible wins every time. Win every time in my schedule, win every time in my life, win every time in my heart, win every time as it comes to how it is that we're supposed to worship, it wins every time. The inspiration of the Word of God. In the authority of God's word, not only do Christians need to believe the Bible and stand on it as a matter of conviction. Do you stand on the Bible as a matter of conviction? I hope you do. We must obey scripture and live by it. And this is the truest test of whether you believe and trust in his word. Is the Bible your authority? Is that what you stand on? Jesus, whether you know it or not, is... is, is um, I would say he's, he's making a play on words here, okay? He, he warned that any teacher who declares invalid, even one of the least of the commandments, will be least in the kingdom. However, whoever keeps and teaches the commandments will be great. Look at what verse 19 says. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. No one can accuse Christ of having a low regard for the inspiration and accuracy and authority of the scripture. Listen to what Jesus says. Any, any willful, ongoing violation of God's law makes one least in the kingdom, which is equal to being outside the kingdom and under condemnation. I 
That's what he says. The one who seeks to keep obeying God's word and teaches others to do so, that person is great in the kingdom. Remember, there's a play on words here, okay? The person, that person is equal to being in the kingdom and has promised a promised expectation of salvation. Christians who love God's word seek to obey it in all things. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. That's in 1 John chapter 2, verse 4. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Where do we find the commandments that Jesus has given us? Where do we find the new covenant? We find it right here. It's the book. Later in chapter 13 of Matthew in the parable of the wheat and the tares, Christ makes it clear in his kingdom, and what is his kingdom? That is the church of Jesus Christ. That is the church of Christ. That is those who identify with Christ, having obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is given us clearly here in the book of Acts and many other places. We know what the gospel is. It's those of us who identify with Christ in that way. There will be true and false believers. That's what, that's what it's teaching us here in chapter 13. There will be true and false believers. There will be True and false believer, those that are error, in error, those that are stuck in some kind of tradition uh, that they might have, and they force others to participate in their error. That could happen right here in Bel Air. That's what the scriptures teach. In all the parables in Matthew chapter 13, the least refers to those who will be judged and cast out while the great shall be included and rewarded. Matthew chapter 13, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. Do you stand up for the truth? Does the truth mean more to you than anything? Does it thus saith the Lord? resonate in your home look at verse 41 the son of man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom gather out of his kingdom what is his kingdom they will gather out of his church the kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace and in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father he who has ears oh one of the great quotes of our Savior. He who has ears, let him hear. Let him hear. And what he's saying is, is he's saying, Stephen, you need to open your ears and open your eyes to what the Scriptures teach. And I say, yes, Lord, help me. Help it not be my will, but thine be done. Because I sure am pulled to want it my way. The enemy moved people away from the scriptures, the Bible as the authority in the first century. Jesus tells us. And he's doing the same today. He distorts grace by turning obedience into legalism. He distorts obedience by making it optional. You believe in Jesus with all your heart as your personal Savior? That's, that's, that's enough. Don't you think that's enough? I mean, how many people believe in Jesus today anyway? The devil distorts the Bible authority by elevating human thinking and reasoning above God's revelation. Now, that's just the truth. You be careful of the books you read out there because many of them are all about that. Churches that follow a business model over biblical leadership, this is not a corporation, ladies and gentlemen. We don't have board of directors. You don't vote. 
on what it is that you want. And the eldership don't make decisions based upon their opinion. We have a king. And we have a thus saith the Lord. And let me tell you what, our eldership is concerned about that because they will be judged for it. How would you like to be in those shoes? Churches that follow a business model instead of biblical leadership. Churches that submit to psychology over doctrinal truth. Now, there is a time and a place for psychologists without question. But there are some folks that want to submit themselves to psychological ideology over Scripture. There are some folks that affirm evolution over the six-day creation. You know, I had a geologist uh, professor of mine. I'm not going to tell you the story. I don't have time to do it. But I mean, sometimes if you want to hear about it, well, bring it on, okay? Because this guy called himself a theistic evolutionist. He tried that with my dad, too. didn't work out very well. People try to distort the distinctions between a male and a female. That's going on in the world today. They try to change what God made into a male, into a female, or into a female. Scripture teaches who we are and what we are and what our place is. The devil today is trying to get us to embrace an alternate sexual lifestyle. Instead of God's design for intimacy in marriage between a man and a woman, that's always been the way it is. Let me tell you something. The common animal out there understands the difference. Romans chapter 1, Jude verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 1. You know what? I didn't say it. It's not my rules. I'm not the one that created this earth. I didn't create men uh, and women and children and all the rest of it. God did. He has a plan. It's in the scripture. If you want to read about it, we can certainly provide you the passages so that you can. But I'm here to tell you something. There are not any alternative sexual lifestyles, ladies and gentlemen. It's man and woman. That's what God Almighty has taught us. And look, God has given us the ability to reason for crying out loud. And we should use it, especially when we're studying the scriptures. But if our reason, if our tradition and the Bible are in conflict, our reason or our tra uh, tradition should bow to the revelation of God's word. The Bible provides the only tracks to guide the Christian. The only roadmap is the scripture. The Bible alone takes us in the best and right direction. Okay, I'm through. Let's summarize. I take a breath. This passage is powerful, isn't it? It elevates your love for God's word in all things. It challenges you to read the Bible carefully and to interpret accurately. And the Lord wrote it so that you could. It scares you out of adding to or altering anything in the Bible. God's word is all sufficient. All scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine and for reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. The God's word is all sufficient. It is inspired. It is God breathed. It is perfect. Every jot, every tittle, every apostrophe, every line, every dot. And it is the authority. Jesus said in John chapter 14, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And he tells us they're not grievous. All sufficient, inspired, and our authority. Are you subject to the Lord's invitation this morning, ladies and gentlemen? Have you read scripture and understand what it is that you need to do in order to become a part of God's family?
Yes, you have to believe with all of your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that He is the Creator along with the Holy Spirit and Jehovah our God, the Father. Yes, absolutely you do. Luke chapter 13 teaches us that we have to repent, we have to turn. We've got to come to the Lord on bended knee. We must confess Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 10. Confess him as Lord and Savior. That's what the scriptures teach. And we must be baptized into Christ. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 16. And many other places. 1 Peter chapter 3. Are you subject to the gospel call this morning? Straight from the God-breathed word. If you are, won't you come as we stand and sing?